the temperature limited. Case numbers A3-2020-1143-1146 Tuesday the 20th of April 2021. Now Mr Grant, um, obviously this is a remote hearing that is being live streamed but it is nonetheless formal for that. Um, can all attendees please make sure that they keep their microphones on mute unless they're speaking. And we intend to take a break morning and afternoon for five to ten minutes. Um, I, I will state a time for resumption so can people make sure they're back uh, promptly. Um, we have discussed this case and done an extensive amount of reading and I must say at the moment we are not quite sure that it needs a full two days but no doubt you'll uh, tell us what you've agreed about the division of submissions. So with that introduction, Mr Grant, over to you to open your appeal. Thank you very much, my lords. Um, I appear with Mr Turner for the appellants, um, and my learned friend Mr Berrigan, uh, who appeared for the respondents below as, as defendants, um, appears for them to also in, in this court. And my lords will have seen that, uh, or may have seen that I am stepping into the shoes of Mr. Dagnall, um, as, he, as he then was, who, who conducted the trial, uh, or both trials below, and um, as your lordships will know, uh, and has since been made up as a master of the Queen's Bench Division. My lords, this appeal is concerned with the proper measure of damages for the victim of a deceit, inducing them to enter into a loss-making transaction. Uh, and my lords, on this side of the court, on the appellant's side, we're inviting your lordships to restate and apply what we conceive to be the conventional measure of loss, where a victim enters into a transaction induced by fraud. That is, as we conceive it, the claimants are entitled to compensatory damages for the price paid for the asset acquired, less the actual value of the benefits received from the transaction, together with damages for consequential losses. Uh, and this is the important point. Irrespective, we say, of whether the claimant purchasers were otherwise commercially unwise in entering into the transaction, and irrespective of whether the losses which would thereby be compensated could be said to be in some way to arise from matters extraneous to the fraud. And we say that's the, the absolutely critical point of law that lies at the heart of this appeal. Um, we also say, with respect, that that is not how His Honour Judge Hodge, Queen's Counsel, approached the matter at first instance. And over the course of our submissions today, we will be respectfully submitting to your Lordships um, that the approach taken by the learned judge below was wrong in law. Um, and we will be saying, suggesting to your Lordships with respect, that the judge should simply have asked this question. What was the actual value of the benefits received by the first claimant? And I'll come on to the, the various claimants and what they claimed. Uh, and should have awarded damages for that, for the difference between that value, i.e. the actual value of the asset acquired, or the assets acquired, and the price paid. As simple as that. Together with, this is the secondary measure of loss, uh, which is time honoured and subject of extensive analysis in the lumber of the authorities, consequential losses, if any. My Lord, so that's the, that's the introduction I wish to, to put before your Lordships as to what this appeal is about. Um, why do you say the first claimant of loss of when um, the judge held that this was a package and you don't appeal that? I mean, surely the correct measure of loss is the difference between the price paid for the package and the value at this date of the transaction or the valuation date the judge set, it doesn't matter, I don't, uh, for the package. I don't, the, judge, the judge below referred to it as a package, and indeed he did so based on evidence given by uh, one of the witnesses called by my clients, which was the effect that um, plainly they wouldn't have entered into contract A 
without entering into contract B and C, and then whereas your lordship will have seen three contracts, so that they were interconnected in that way. But as your lordships may have also seen, the parties to the various contracts were different. The party to contract one, what is known as the APA, was C1, and the party to contracts B and C, the property contracts, were C2, the partnership, as your lordships will also have seen. But for the purposes of assessing loss, you can't arrogate, we would say, losses or benefits acquired by legal person one in the shape of a limited company, C1, and legal person two in the shape of the partnership. They are different entities in law, and there is no principle of law that I'm aware of which permits one to somehow offset gains made by party one against losses made by party two. Glossop is a freestanding, legally recognized entity. It has a separate legal personality, and nobody suggested at first instance, so far as I'm aware, that there should be some form of overall tossing up or tossing down. So that's my answer to that question. I'm going to develop that point a little further on in my submissions. My lords, can I just turn now to the broad background to this? I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this. Your lordships will have seen that my clients, or rather my first client, the first claimant, Glossop, runs a packaging and printing business supplying carton board products to a variety of companies in the food and pharmaceuticals industry. And they ran their business before this transaction from premises in Glossop called the Old Mill. And your lordships will have seen that they purchased the business of the company known as Contact. And they did so via an asset purchase agreement with other contracts related, and I'll come on to this. And your lordships will have seen that the underlying proceedings at first instance comprised claims in misrepresentation, primarily put as fraudulent misrepresentation or in the alternative negligent misrepresentation, and also claims for breach of contract arising from that purchase. And the purchase was, in essence, of another printing and packaging business, as I say, run by D1, which was carried on in premises in Stockport known as Units 3 to 5 Hague Avenue, relatively close by to the premises that the first claimant was running its original business from in Glossop. And your lordships will have also seen, or may have seen, that there are three defendants. Defendant 1 is the company that ran the Stockport business, if I can put it like that. Defendant 2, Mr. Smith, was the guiding mind of Defendant 1. He was its sole director, I believe, and he was its sole owner, albeit that there was a company between his shareholding and D1 itself. That's of no import on this appeal. My lords, the third defendant, feature in this case only relatively marginally, in that they were the owners of one of the units at Hague Avenue. And it was held by the judge, not in any way the subject of any form of cross-appeal, that representations made by Mr. Smith in the run-up to the set of contracts which were at issue by Mr. Smith, representations by Mr. Smith, were to be deemed as made by, on behalf of, not only himself, but also D1 and D3. And as my lord, the master rules, points out, there were three separate contracts which were entered into all on the same day, that is the 23rd of November 2015. Can I just, in order just to ground this, there is an element of factual complexity in this case, which I'm going to hope to not delve too much into. There were three contracts all simultaneously entered into. Contract number one, known by everyone, and on this appeal as the Asset Purchase Agreement, the APA, was 
entered into between C1 and D1. Not a share, not a share purchase agreement, an asset purchase agreement. And uh, uh, the, the, the total consideration payable in respect of the APA, as I'll call it, was 1.253 million pounds. And it was common ground between the parties and the experts that that contract price between C1 and D1 for the business assets uh, was broken down into three constituent parts. And let me briefly allude to what they were. Part one, 750,000 pounds of that consideration was ascribable to plant and machinery. 203,000 pounds was ascribable to stock and works in progress. And the remaining 300,000 pounds was ascribable to something known as goodwill. Um, and that's common ground between the parties, I should say. Um, well, that's, that's common ground between the parties now, but it was nothing to do with the transaction at the time, right? Well, I don't think, I think it's, you, your lordships don't have the APA in the bundle. We've done our, we've, we've done our very level best to, to, to save this court. Yes, okay. from, What's the answer to the question? It was nothing to do with the contract. Well, the the is contract just, itself right. did not identify that breakdown. And there, was no, there was no evidence before the court uh, that um, anybody had made that breakdown. Um, it was something the experts did afterwards. No, I think I don't think that's right. I think I think the parties themselves ascribed those three figures. Or I should I should say not the parties. C one. I think I think the evidence was that C one in its own mind said that we're going to ascribe seven fifty to the plant machinery, 203 to the stock, and 300 to the goodwill. So that wasn't an agreement. I'm not suggesting there was a, there was a contractual uh, uh, agreement between the parties preceding the APA, or indeed contained within the APA. But, but that, that breakdown was certainly agreed between the experts as a proper way of breaking down that, uh, 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 that contract price overall. My lords, that's the first the second contract was a, 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 a sale of leases and related to, the, to units four and five. There were three units of the Hague Avenue site. Units four and five were, per, were owned by, uh, were purchased, I should say, by the Raymond Joseph Partnership, which is C2. And that, that contract was known as the PSA, the Property Sale Agreement. Uh, uh, below and in the, con and in the judgments of, the, of Judge Hodge. And the consideration payable for units four and five, the leases, the long leases of, that, of those units, was £1.163 million. Pounds. Your Lordships are not going to hear much more about that agreement, uh, 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 I'm pleased to tell you. And the final agreement, my Lord, my Lords, was known as the lease sale agreement. And that was, that phraseology was used merely to distinguish it from the, the, the agreement to purchase units four and five. It was the same essential agreement. It was the purchase of a lease, but it was uh, uh, by way of a separate agreement. It related to unit three, uh, and it was a sale by D2 and D3, Mr. Smith and his pension trustees. And the, the consideration for that, and it was a consideration payable by the partnership, C2, which purchased unit three, and the consideration was £200,000. So that, that's the overall package of agreements that was entered into by the various parties on the 23rd of November. And my lords, the bulk of that consideration was paid and payable uh, uh, on the 23rd of November. There were four deferred payments uh, of £112,500 uh, each in respect of contract number one. So roughly speaking, £450,000 of the £1.253 million was payable over a period of two years. The bulk of it, as I say, was a pay payable and paid immediately. And the first three deferred payments were indeed duly paid by my clients under the APA. The fourth and final instalment was payable or fell due on the 30th of, no of December 2017, so roughly two years after the contracts were entered into. And your lordships may have seen that at that stage, 
my client said, no, we don't, we don't propose to pay that final installment, and they triggered a, 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 an interim dispute mechanism, if I can put it that way, which your logics would have seen is a common, common mechanism in which one finds in share sale agreements and asset sale agreements. And essentially, it provided for a form of interim expert determination by an independent barrister. And what my clients did is they presented their case to an appointed independent barrister um, and set out why they said that they were entitled to uh, withhold the final payment. The independent barrister uh, gave a written ruling, and he indeed ruled that on the evidence before him, and of course it, was a, it wasn't a binding ruling in any shape or form, that my clients were entitled to withhold that final uh, uh, installment, and they duly did so. And your lordships will come on to this later, but costs were incurred in uh, undertaking that uh, process. And my lords, that set the scene for my clients to issue proceedings, both in contract and tort, as your lordships will have seen. They did so, both parties brought various claims in contract and in tort, uh, under the various contracts that I've mentioned, and those claims were issued in December 17, and duly came before Judge Hodge, uh, sitting in the Manchester District Registry in August 2019. And your lordships will have seen, or may have seen, that there was a, an eight-day trial um, in August of 2019. Mr. Dagnall appeared for the claimants. Mr. Grant, we, we really aren't fully aware of all this, you know. We've, yes. we've read the papers, so we don't need a summary of the history of the world. No, no, quite we've not read, quite. read your skeleton, we've read the judgments very carefully. We really need the argument on the points on appeal. I mean, I, you didn't answer my question as to how long you thought your submissions were going to be, but if you're going to tell us everything that ever happened, it's going to be very long. And what I, what I, is your estimate? My, my, my own estimate is that I'm certainly going to finish before the day is out. Good, good. Okay. I'm, I'm glad to be the, the bringer of good tidings, if, that, if that's some. No, those are good, if those are indeed good tidings, my lord. Well, I would have thought earlier than that, to be honest. But well, I will, I will. Let's come to the chase and get the argument, because... Uh, you know, we know the facts. Well, my lord, I, I, I was being a little, um, taking it a little slowly, only for, for this reason. It may be that I've, 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 I've misjudged my court, but I, the, 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 the judgments are, as your lordships may have discovered to your cost, immensely lengthy, and that's no disrespect to Judge Hodge, I should say. And the first judgment is a, is a judgment of 50 pages of some complex, of some complex. Well, it's not um, complexity, it's rambling. Um, but there we are. That's well, what it is. We've well, read it. We know what's in it. Um, the first 90 paragraphs are pretty irrelevant. Um, paragraph 90 is quite important. Paragraph 9 is quite important. Paragraph 103 is quite important. And paragraphs 21 and following of the quantum judgment are quite important. We've read all that. Well, well can I... Can I... I wasn't. I should say. Can I give you this piece of this this um, um piece of good news? I was not proposing in any way to take your lordships through through the first through the first judgment. Only I was going to stop at a few of the paragraphs. Can I can I do that? And your lordship will move me on if you. I'm. I mean, I, I don't want to stop you, Mr. Grant, but I and you must take your own course. But I am interested in the argument that you advance as to why the judge was wrong, why we should allow the appeal. Quite right, my lord. Yes. We should do if we are to allow the appeal. Now that defence against you, as I understand it, is that it's all your own fault. Maybe not your own fault, but Mr. Dagnall's argument as reflected in paragraph uh, 24, I think, of the quantum judgment and paragraph 90 of the liability judgment was misleading, misled the judge, and you can't now have it, um, have it you can't unwind history. Well, well, that that, that's wrong, and I'm going to seek to, to explain to your lordship why that's wrong. Can I, can I immediately, can I, your lordships will have seen that, that of the various representations that were, that were put before the judge as being misrepresentations, and indeed fraudulent misrepresentations, the judge held that two were fraudulent. Your lordships will have seen what they were. I'm not going to in any way go back over, over those, you'll be delighted to know. 
What I was going to do, if I may, is, and I'm paying very clear heed to what your lordship has said, is invite your lordships to pick up that on that liability judgment. So just look at a few of the of the paragraphs, um, just so I can ground my submissions. Um, my lords will have seen that. Start. Can I? Can we just start at page one two one of the um, of of the core bundle, which is, I suspect tabs will be of no relevance to your lordship, but I can, it's tab 15. Would you be so good as to refer to paragraphs in the judgments? So I've got them electronically separately. Thank you very much, my lord, yeah. So I'm, first of all, I'm looking at paragraph 26, and your lordships will have seen there that um, the judge was invited by counsel uh, to effectively bifurcate the hearing, and he, and he met with no resistance. From Mr. From Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Dagnall, and the the approach that he adopted, which we can see in the last seven lines, of para twenty para twenty six, is that he's going to deal with issues of principle and the correct approach to damages in judgment one, so that the expert accountants will know what more is required of them, but not with individual items of damage. And your lordships can read on if your lordships would care to to the end. So that essentially be be Mr. Lander, who was then appearing for the defendants, had invited the judge to adopt this bifurcated approach on day one of the trial, and he agreed to and he agreed to do so. But nonetheless, what he did, what, what is absolutely clear is that such guidance as he gave on the a proper approach to damages in judgment one was not provisional. And of course it could be wrong, it couldn't be provisional, but what he did say was provisional was any any references he made to particular numbers uh, or particular findings about the numbers. So, so that's the approach he took, and that was an approach which Mr. Dagnall was, was, was content with, and I certainly don't resolve from that. My lords, we then turn to power of 44 um, uh, uh, of, the, of the judgment, and that's page 131 in case that's of any help to, to your lordships. And um, we then have, we have here a section on the applicable law, um, and, and there was a there's a, a reference to Mr. Justice Jacob's judgment, which I don't think I need to trouble your lordships with. Um, and and we, we see at the right at the end of para 44, the, the learned judge saying this of particular importance in the context of the present case is the rule that the normal method of calculating the loss caused by the deceased, the price paid, less the real value of the subject matter of the transaction. And of course, I adopt that as an entirely uh, uh, orthodox statements of the of the of the of the law. My lords, over the page, uh, paragraph forty six, page one three two. Um, we, I just wanted to pick up one thing there, where the judge re re recorded a submission of Mr. Dagnall, uh, uh, founded on Smith New Court. And if we pick up at line four or five, he submitted, in my view, correctly, says the learned judge, that if, as a result of a fraudulent misrepresentation, the claimant acquires a flawed asset, he can recover the full loss attributable to those flaws, even though they were wholly unconnected to the fraudulent misrepresentations, because those flaws feed into and inform the true value of the subject matter of the sale transaction as at the date of the relevant sale. And again, I, I respectfully suggest that that was a, 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 a proper statement of the, of, of the law, and, and as I'll endeavour to show, the judge then departed from that correct statement of the law. Um, both in this judgment and indeed in more, more particularly in the in the in the quantum judgment. So my lord, that's para 46. And I didn't want to say anything more about um, how the judge dealt with the law um, in in that judgment. He deals with the electricity supply representation of Paris 50 onwards, and I'm not going to take your lordships to to to, to the factual complexities and niceties of of of, of that. Um, and I was going to show your lordship para 61, just briefly, if I may, page 138 of the bundle, um, where the judge records this. In light of Mr. McDagnall's submission founded upon Smith New Court, that if as a result of a fraudulent misrepresentation the claimant acquires a flawed asset, he can recover the full loss attributable to those flaws, even though they are wholly unconnected to the fraudulent misrepresentation. Um, and again, I commend that statement of the law as being, with the greatest respect, an accurate one. And it is, again, the burden of my appeal that 
his lordship below didn't then, as it turns out, follow his own correct statement of the law at paragraph 61, and indeed in earlier paragraphs, as I've showed your lordship. We then trace straight through to paragraph 90, page 149, and my lord was, with respect, correct to say that this is of significance. Here, his lordship comes back to Smith New Court. He recalls Mr. Dagnall's emphasis in closing line four, that it was damage suffered by entering into the transaction which was recoverable, and not merely the damage flowing from the fraudulent electricity supply and flooding misrepresentations. And again, I commend that as, with respect, an accurate statement of the law and the proper approach to take on this case. He refers to the global package, as my lord and master roles referred to earlier. The transaction for this purpose is the global package, comprising the purchase, and your lordship can read on, and your lordship can read on to the end of paragraph 90. Paragraph 91, he, of course, for the purposes of awarding damages for, under head one in the Smith New Court taxonomy, head one being the direct loss suffered by the person who enters into the transaction induced by a fraud, one has to take a valuation date. And my lord below takes, Judge Hodge took the 11th of December 2015, and I don't make any complaint about that, and it didn't matter whether it was the 11th of December or the 23rd of November. There was no difference between those two, and that's paragraph 91. My lords, can I shoot straight through to paragraph 99 of the same judgment? We're now at page 154 of the bundle, paragraph 99. I want to spend a little time here on this. In his closing, Mr. Dagnall submitted that the key question is the actual value of the contact business at the valuation date, pausing there at the valuation date having been fixed by the judge at the 11th of December 2015, for reasons we don't need to go into. Every problem from which the contact business then suffered, whether it was latent or not, is said to be relevant to diminish that value unless the claimants had fully appreciated it and factored it in to the purchase price. It did not matter in relation to any problem that, and then Mr. Dagnall set out four differing issues that were irrelevant to the proper assessment of damage. And then there's a reference to mitigation, which I don't think we need to go into for the purposes of this appeal, because there were findings made about mitigation, which I don't in any way seek to dislodge before your lordships. And then finally, at paragraph 90 over the page of 155, if those bases or assumptions were wrong, then the claimants would have overpaid. But even if they were the result of their own carelessness or over-optimism, they would still have suffered damage equivalent to the amount of that faulty overpayment. Essentially, it is said by Mr. Dagnall that in the case of fraud and misrepresentation, the claimants can recover the cost of their own bad bargain. And I respectfully suggest that Mr. Dagnall's submission, as recorded in those last two lines or those last two sentences, is an accurate submission as to the law. You say Mr. Dagnall was right in that paragraph and the judge said he was wrong in 103. Boiling it down to its essence, my lord, I do. Yes, exactly. Boiling it down to its essence, my lord, that's 90. Can I just, but I, and I, we're only going to spend another five minutes on the liability judgment, I can assure your lordship. But can I just show your lordship paragraph 101? Because that's a continuation of Mr. Dagnall's submissions. First, the claimants did not contract on the basis that they would need to incur substantial external costs or provide an external storage facility. It's now common ground that even if they mitigated their loss, they'd have needed to do so. Now, just, can I just explain that? Because it becomes relevant at a later stage in my submission. Essentially, what that, what 
the evidence showed, by the way, my lords with the spoils, the claimants had falsely, when I say falsely, over-optimistically and incorrectly assumed that having purchased the, the first defendant's business, they would be able to bring all their business into the Hague Avenue site. They could sell the old mill, their old premises, and they would then acquire all the benefits of uh, uh, the synergy of both companies coming together, and that they would not have to incur any form of external storage costs. And the, to put that into perspective, or, or to put meat on the bone, here we have a business which is printing cartons for food cartons, let's say, and it's got nice graphics on it, and, but those cartons have to be stored somewhere before they are trans transported to the customer. And the understanding, and as it turns out, incorrect understanding of the claimants, was that all that storage could take place within units three to five. And it became apparent, and it was conceded by Mr. Dagnall during the first hearing, that that was an over-optimistic understanding of the claimants. And it, had, it was an over-optimistic understanding, which critically had fed into their willingness to pay the notional £300,000 for goodwill. But it was a mistake they made. It was not a mistake in any way connected. I entirely concede to the um, fraudulent misrepresentations that were found by the judge. Um, and then various other mistakes and misapprehensions. Um, were set out in Mr. Dagnall's submissions as recorded at paragraph 101. For instance, we see at little two, the fact that the claimants mistakenly thought they were buying unit three with a particular supply of electricity when in fact it had less, and two, a 300 amp supply would be sufficient for their purposes. I mean, these are complexities one doesn't need to go into too much detail on, but what they do is, is provide further instances of the, of the claimants, my clients, or first claimants, proceeding on the basis that certain savings could be made or certain profits could be achieved. Um, and Mr. Dagnall submits that if that fed into a overpayment, so to speak, for the goodwill, then that fell to be compensated. Um, as he records at the end of lines, at the end of little paragraph two, if as it turns out they were wrong and they made a bad bargain, they can still recover the entire over, overpayment. And, and I should say, we don't need to go into the all the all the sinews uh, 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 of, of the 300 amp supply. They, these are mere instances of a, of a broader proposition. But are they not all completely and totally irrelevant to the calculation of direct loss? I mean, is it not the case that the calculation of direct loss looks to establish the actual value, the market value of what they bought, full stop? And what, full stop. They, what they may have thought, what they may have wanted to do, what they may not have wanted to do, what they calculated or didn't calculate, or even discussed with the other side, is a matter of complete irrelevance. Now, it may be relevant to... Um, claiming consequential losses, possibly, no. but certainly not relevant to establishing what is the value of the business when, that they actually bought. Well, can I, let me answer that question, if I may, in this way. If we look at the pleadings, and I was going to briefly look at the pleadings, and I emphasise the word briefly. I've had the misfortune to look at them already, Mr. Grant, yes. Well, my Lord, I... I I, I, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and, I, and I was going to. I was hoping your lordship was going to say you haven't gone there because I would have then sought to save your lordship from doing so by just showing your lordship three, three paragraphs of the pleadings. No, we, um, we may need to look at them. Yes, but the but essentially what and I'll I'll say this before before going to the documents. But essentially the way the matter was put was as follows: Mr. Dagnall pleading out said that in the loss section, says the loss is 
the different that well there are two elements of loss and this is absolutely hornbook law of course difference in value so to speak, which is a, in itself a slightly a slightly misconceived concept but one knows what it means so direct loss and consequential loss and the 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 way the experts went about assessing direct loss was twofold. And they were both merely forensic tools to get into the same final answer, I'd say. The first method that the experts adopted was to say, let's use £300,000, which was the sum ascribable to goodwill. And I, I say that because everyone agrees that the the two other elements of the of the purchase price for the asset purchase agreement, i.e. the plant and the stock, everyone agreed that that was fine. The £750,000 that was paid for the plant was indeed a proper payment and the plant was worth what was paid for it. Ditto the stock. So that just left the goodwill as the, as the, the figure which emphasis was put on and consideration was given to. And the way the experts went about it was to say, let's assume that the value of the goodwill was £300,000 on the basis of all the things the claimants themselves thought about this business. So based on the claimants, as it turns out, misapprehension as to the attributes of this business and as to the, the, the benefits they could achieve by buying it, Let's assume £300,000 was a proper figure to adopt, a proper value on that, mis on that set of misapprehensions. And that was a and complete and total misunderstanding, a nonsense, something that should never have happened and they should never have done because what they may have thought or not thought about what they were getting or not getting is not relevant. What is relevant is what they were getting or not getting and what its value was on the open market. Well, and the experts I... never address minds to that, and that's the problem, and that's what Mr. Berrigan is going to um, fix on and say, this is all your fault. You, you, you got your experts running around in all different directions with all sorts of very silly ideas about what they were supposed to be doing, and that's what's given rise to your problem, and now you're fixed with it. I mean, well, that's basically what he's saying. Yes. The, the, let me answer that question directly, if I may. Which is, I of course accept, my lord, that the final and the final and sole question was, and it is time honoured, and no surprise to any of your lordships, that the in, in ascertaining what the direct loss direct loss was, i.e., head one as opposed to head two, which we'll call consequential loss. The, 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 the sole final question was, what was the market value of the asset acquired? I accept that. The, the, but what the experts did via this methodology, they weren't, they weren't answering, asking the wrong question. They were simply using a forensic methodology to, to answer the correct question. And, but, but let me say this, that wasn't the sole methodology they adopted. And, and in order to answer Mr. Berrigan's point, I'm going to show you, I'm afraid, afraid I'm going to have to show your lordship some, act, some parts of the expert evidence to show that, to show that it's simply, well, it, A, it's simply not right that the experts proceeded, or, or more, more importantly, the claimant's expert, proceeded solely down Avenue 1 as opposed to Avenue 2. The, what I will show you is that Mr. Green asked the right question and answered the right question, but adopted two different methodologies as forensic tools only to get to the right answer. Second. Sorry, my lord. What was the second one? The second one was simply to say the goodwill in the second one is simply to say this. Here we have a loss-making business. Not only a loss-making business, but a massively loss-making business, as I will show your lordships. And in those circumstances, it is conventional simply to treat the goodwill as you know, conventional, not just conventional, it's obvious, to, to, to ascribe a nil value to the goodwill of, an, of a 
of a massively loss-making business. And that there's not that it requires authority from my lords or, or other judges in, in, in this court, but there is authority, I can show your lordships, to, whereby judges, English judges, when one has a loss-making business, then then the goodwill is bound to be worth zero. So since the judge said it was a massively loss-making business at paragraph 8 or 9 of his judgment, and that was a holding, um, a finding, um, why didn't Mr. Dagnall simply say, um, since it seems to have been agreed that the value of everything else sold under the asset sale agreement was um, as everybody thought, um, why didn't um, Mr. Dagnall simply submit, I want £300 for direct loss, and now let's talk about consequential loss? Well, my lord, he, he, he did submit that, and I'm going to show you, Lord, where he submitted he that. Didn't. He didn't. Well, well my lord... Because when we get to paragraph 103, he, uh, he seems to have submitted, I think it's, uh, sorry, I'm, I may be getting the numbers wrong, 99 and 103, we see that he he seems to have gone down the judge's road. And then when we see the quantum judgment, he compounds it even further. But I assumed you were going to say that the reason he goes and performs all these some sort of quantum judgment is because of what the judge had decided in the liability judgment. Well, my lord, I'm, I'm if I may say so, making a number of submissions, so I'm certainly not confining myself to a single one. I am what I am saying is that paragraph 103, um, which is a, which is a, 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 we're back at the liability judgments, or rather we're still in the liability judgments. Yeah. Um, I, 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 can I, my lord, I am conscious of what your lordship has said, and I'm not in any way evading it because it's, it's a, it's a, uh, is obviously a, a, a pertinent question lordship poses. But can I just, before going to that, just polish off? The remainder of the liability judgment. So we can all notionally close that book, perhaps with a sigh of relief, but notionally close that book and then move on to the quantum judgment. Because I'm going to show you what Mr. Dagnall said in the quantum uh, was recorded as submitted to the judgment. But just before we get there, let's, if I hope we're all at paragraph at page 156, this is paragraph, the end of paragraph 101. Um, and I just wanted to show your lordship's little four. And I'm not evading your lordship's question anyway. I just thought, let's just finish this off. Little four at 156. Even if, as I find, the claimants have failed fully to appreciate the problems with contact and its losses, and the difficulty of integrating the two businesses and being able to realize the old mill, that I can not sell it. And were over-optimistic as to all of these matters, and also as to the potential profits, even if they had no, there been no profit. The claimants can still sue for the resultant overpayment of the acquisition price as difference in value and or the resultant cost as consequential losses. Now that's a submission which I again say Mr. Dagnall was quite entitled to make and it was a correct submission. And it does not matter, continues the judge, that there are they are not connected with the misreps or that they were the result of the claimant's over-optimism or lack of subsequent trading success. The reason I'm emphasizing that submission now, while we're in the liability judgment, is because we see the judge's answer to that submission in the quantum judgment. Um, the the power 102 is judge, the judge sort of says in broad terms there's considerable force in these submissions, but then but then um, blunts them, we would say, by a number of its countervailing considerations. And this is power this is power 102 little two. And let me just concentrate on two alone. The claimants knew that they were buying into a loss making business which would require turning around this would involve staff having to be redundant. This was presumably factored into the purchase price in my judgment. The risks of any loss of business that might be suffered by the claimants as a result of the need to address those issues would similarly fall to be treated as having been appreciated by the claimants and factored into the price. Um, that's a fine, that's a holding by the judge, which we say was wrong. And it's a holding that translates itself finally into power 103. Let me spend a little time on 103. Um, page 157. The decision of the House of Lords and Smith New Court establishes, and we can read on to the end of 
um, at that sentence. However, those damages must be assessed on the basis of the innocent claim that has acted reasonably to mitigate its loss upon discovering the fraud. Quite, of course, I don't concede, I don't in any way quarrel with that, with that, with that sentence. It's nothing to do with my appeal. Um, because, not least because the concept of mitigation can only relate to consequential loss. Direct loss is suffered in stanza, the moment when you watch it a lot. I, I, I won't persist in that submission. But then, then this sentence, which is a, 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 a I mean, reference. Just, just, just uh, Mr. Grant, just to note, it is possible for mitigation to intervene in the calculation of direct loss. If, for example, um, Mr. Jones, as opposed to Mr. Smith, had come up to um, the claimants the day after the transaction and said, I will give you uh, 1.5 million for the assets you bought under the asset purchase agreement, and they'd said no, um, knowing of the fraud uh, that had been perpetrated, then there might have been some question of mitigation. But uh, that's not this case. I, I, I don't want to get into a debate with your lordship, but that's, that gives rise to a nice question of, of, of law, which I, I, I suspect there might be two, two, two views on it. But I don't think we need to go into it. I see that that might have been an arguable point. I completely concede that. Um, then this sentence, which is line six or so of the judgment of 103, nor should a claimant be entitled to recover in respect to potential losses which it had fully appreciated and factored into the purchase price. I've already pointed out that if the electricity supply representation had been made, had not been made, the claimants would have been prompted to investigate the electricity supply to Unit 3, potentially leading to the discovery, etc., etc. Um, I, I quarrel, with the greatest respect, I quarrel with that sentence. And it's not just a random sentence in a long judgment. It, it takes wing, if I can put it that way, when we get to the quantum judgment. Um, it takes wing in a substantial way. Um, and I quarrel with it. I think I say it's wrong with great respect. But it then it's compounded and in the last sentence of Para 103, which starts with the phrase, with words, this justifies an approach to the assessment of damages that compensates the claims for the fact that Unit 3 suffered from inadequate power supply. But it should not operate to insulate the claims from potential commercial risk which they had appreciated and factored into their calculation of the purchase price because to do so would overcompensate the claims now uh, um, for the consequence of the defendant's fraud. Now, I, I will immediately say I don't, it's difficult, I find it difficult to fully comprehend what that means. Um, and I don't quite know what factoring something into the calculation of the purchase price means in the context of the simple question that the you say it's wrong. I say it's wrong. I say it's wrong, and it, it's misconceived. I, I, it's wrong. It, it departs from what he stated the law to be. It's confusing consequential and direct loss. It's looking at what would have happened if the misrepresentations had been true or if they had been made. It's it's just it, it's just off beam the whole paragraph. Well, that, that that is my. Respectful submission. I certainly wouldn't put it that way, but my lord is in is in a different position to me. I I, I simply submit with the greatest respect that it's wrong. Um, yeah. um, my lord. So I don't think I need to say anything more. And I may have said too much already about the liability judgment. I was going to go briefly through the quantum judgment just to show how it was constructed. Um, no. Will your lord just be be cross with me if I do that? No, we're not going to be crazy. Well, well, I, 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 will, I just don't want to say that. that we've read it and indeed analysed it. Well, my lord, I'm, 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 I'm very grateful to all three of your lordships for doing so, and I, I you know, one, one, one's conscious of the, of the burdens placed upon the Court of Appeal, and one should never be presumpt, presumptuous about, about how much pre-reading it's been possible to, under, to undertake. Um, so once, it's very difficult to know precisely how far to go and how far not to go. Um, and one's been in appeals where one assumes things which turns out one shouldn't have assumed. Um, so the councils, I, I say this as a mayor, uh, as an apology, uh, um, uh, that one never quite knows. Keep going, Mr. Grant. Thank you, my lord. I will be prompt, I will be emboldened by by those kind those kind kind of words. So my lords will know that the the a judgment was then handed down as we've just read, and a, a, a reserved judgment. 
in September of 19, and an order was indeed made. And can I just show your lordship very briefly that order? Um, it's not of great interest, um, but there's just one passage which perhaps is of some relevance to look at. The order, my lord, is at tab 14, page 107 of the core bundle. Um, it's dated the 14th of November 19, that's just the date of its sealing. It was actually made on the 11th of September, the same day as the judgment was handed down. It is it in the electronic bundle, do you know? Page 107, my lord, tab 14. Mm -hmm. No, it's more like 110. Yeah. Well, I, I, in which case, in which case there is a, um, I'm, I'm regretfully having not, despite having listened attentively to the master world world's sound words on these, I'm, I am using a, um, this may lead to my appeal being dismissed immediately, but I'm using a, 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 a written, um, a, a hard copy. You're but using a paper bundle. Well, I, I have yet to the stage that we dismiss appeals because people use paper, Mr. Grant. I'm sure if I had my way, it would come, but it hasn't come yet. Well, I, I, I so, but if you, could, if you could just remember that we're, anyway, some of uh, their lordships are using um, um, electronic bundles. I think it is 110, is it? Well, it's well, start, I, he's ordered that, is that 109 at the bottom? Yeah. Is that page 109 of the, of the electronic bundles? It's, 10, it's 109 of the electronic, 107 of the paper. I, I will add two pages. I'll add two, two. I'm so sorry about that, my lord. It's because um, typically these uh, bundles, um, the numbering ignores the index. Of course, of course. The pages one and two are the index. Yeah, you're quite right, my lord. Um, so you'll have seen there was a very a very lengthy um, order was made uh, flowing from the liability judgment, and a lot of it is is the, the mechanics of the ex of new expert reports. Um, from Mr. Milnes and Mr. Um, Mr. King, none of which your lordships have been troubled with, I'm pleased to say, um, and um, on all sorts of subtle matters. Um, the, but if one turns to, to Little Fun uh, um, at Electronic Bundle 110, I think, I'm going to ask my learned junior to have the Electronic Bundle available so he can correct me. Um, we see, my lords, the, the parties have permission to rely upon a further report from their respective accountancy experts. In each case, each further report shall be in the form of a single composite report capable of being read without reference to earlier reports. And the, uh, indeed, the, the experts are specifically directed to certain paragraphs in the judgment. And your lordships will see the paragraphs that are there, that are there mentioned, and then there's provisions for the, for the experts to then produce consequential reports and to come together and to and to come up with a joint statement, all the rest of it. Um, so that's all I wanted to show your lordships in that, or, in that order. In that order, Judy led to a yet further four days of court time being spent in March of last year, back in Manchester, before Judge Hodge. Only this time, Mr. Lander un unfortunately had to drop out for, for uh, uh, personal reasons, and Mr. Berrigan picked up the baton for the defendants. And we see the judge, we see that at Paragraph at tab 16, page 162, which I believe is the first page or the heading of the quantum judgment. So my lord, that quantum judgment was given ex tempore on the 9th of March after a four day, further, a further four day trial. Um, and can I just, just show your lordship the number of the sub -parag the paragraphs of that judgment. Um, paragraph one, um, what is interesting about paragraph one is that is that um, the the judge sets out the judge is clearly aware or believes that the issues that have been raised before him are not simply a question of adding or subtracting numbers, but give rise to a genuine point of substantive law, and he adverts to that in line three uh, in sentence three. In particular, it raised the question whether a fraudulent seller is liable for losses sustained as a result of commercial misjudgments on the part of the innocent purchaser, which are wholly unrelated to the fraud of the seller, save that they result from the entry into the relevant consideration. And what that must mean, I suggest, and I'm not going to, this part of my submissions, I'm not proposing to, to make substantive submissions. I'm simply trying to set out and explain, so far as I'm able, the judge's reasoning. What that seems to mean, or to be adverting to, is what if 
a claimant such as my first client, Glossop, has decided to spend £300,000 on the goodwill of a loss-making company based on a heap of, of over-optimistic misjudgments, commercial misjudgments. Um, and the question that the judge is asking, as I understand it, is simply to say this. Can it, can it be right that a defendant who has induced the transaction by his fraud should be liable to underwrite, so to speak, losses flowing from that, which in fact proceed from, the, from, from commercial misjudgments and over-optimisms and perhaps carelessness on the part of a claimant in ascribing too much value to the asset being bought? That appears to be what the judge is saying, and, and, we can, and we'll see that in action. And, and again, to, 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 use, to deploy the, the direct language of my lord, the master roles, we say that's wrong and off beam, to, uh, to use that phrase. I don't think off beam is terribly rude, uh, Mr. Grant. I mean, it is, you say, unorthodox and contrary to the principles that he himself. Yes. And, and um, it, it's all very well, but there are countless authorities that say um, that uh, Lord Hoffman specifically said no contributory negligence in uh, assessing damages for fraud. Yes. And, and that you're entitled to your direct losses that flow from the transaction. And at various stages in this judgment and in the previous one, the judge, and, and we can analyze them because actually they are identifiable, he moves away from talking about losses flowing from the transaction to losses flowing from the misrepresentations. And that, so. that's the error that you say he made. Um, but the, the, there is a, a need, as I keep on saying, but it is important to hold you to it because it's where the, this appeal really um, has to be determined. Uh, to, to, there is a, a necessity to analyze why he made those mistakes. Because if he made those mistakes as a result of, of um, the submissions made by counsel for the claimants, and only as a result of that, uh, then there might be one outcome. And if he made them because he made, got the law wrong, fine, um, we can overrule that and, and set it right. But the... But, um, well, I'm going to show you, Lordship, that he certainly did, that it was certainly not Mr. Dagnall's sub submission that overpayment, so to speak, as a result of commercial misjudgments on the part of the claimant should be should should not be compensated. Um, quite the quite the reverse. He, Mr. Dagnall, did get into the weeds in I think paragraph twenty four of this judgment, if he's properly recorded, he got into the weeds of, of making a submission which is a, as unintelligible as the paragraph that we looked at in the liability judgment. Well, Lord, unintelligibility is one thing. Misleading the court and getting the law wrong is another. And I... Mr. Dangle, let's be absolutely clear about this, was never misleading the court. No, he no, no, may, I, I he may have made a submission that was wrong, or he may have made a submission that was unhelpful and, and led the judge to make a, a wrong finding or holding, but he didn't mislead the court. I'm no, 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 I, I, of course yeah. Yeah. Last person in the world to do that would be Mr. I, I would Dagnall. say the last person in the world to do that, yes. Yeah. Okay, keep going anyway. We've looked well, at... So that's, par that's paragraph one. Um, yeah. Let's go straight to paragraph five, five now, um, where it's clear that the judge, he, he looks back to his earlier holdings in the liability judgment, um, and I'm not going to... He recites certain things, um, and indeed, he notes that he had previously noted, and this is the, the last uh, few lines of paragraph five, that the normal method of calculating the loss caused by the deceit was, and your lordships can read on. Um, the, we, then, we then, Mr. Berrigan recites a, a, a whole host of findings the judge had previously made, which I don't think we need to go into at paragraph six. Paragraph seven. Um, we see the recitation of the submissions at para 99, which I've already shown your lordship at para 7. So, um, and then at paragraph 8, he, he recites further submissions. And then at paragraph 9, and, 
I should say this that, that in the context of your lordship saying, well, one of one open question is whether Mr. Mr. Dagnall had had made a submission that led the judges into error. Um, Mr. Mr. Dagnall expressly submitted as the judge recorded a paragraph eight that that the claim that this is over the page. The claimants could still sue for the resultant overpayment of the acquisition price as difference in value. Um, even if they'd been over optimistic when it came to fixing the price they were willing to pay for the asset. And the last sentence, which I embrace um, as correct with the greatest respect, it did not matter that these were not connected with the misrepresentations, or they were the result of the claimants over optimism and lack of subsequent trading success. And what I'm going to, to be absolutely clear with your lordships, I'm going to suggest to your lordships, and I'm going to demonstrate if I can, that that submission was a correct submission, and the judge rejected it. The judge, of course, had to was faced with conflicting submissions and had to come to a conclusion. I think you right. can see, Mr. Grant, I think we'll see in a minute that that wasn't the problem. It's quite clear that Mr. Dagnall, at both stages, made the correct submission as to what the measure of loss was for deceit. The problem was the submissions he made about how it should be calculated in this case. Oh, come on. Well, I, we'll, 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 I'm not going to shrink from that. Um, my Lord, paragraph 9, which is page 167, I believe, of the electronic bundle, um, the judge obviously takes the view that paragraph 103 of his previous judgment is important because he goes to the trouble of quoting it in full, as your lordships will see. Um, paragraph 10, he distinguishes between the principles that he had adumbrated in the first judgment, which of course were binding upon him, they weren't, you know, they weren't provisional, uh, and, and um, preliminary indications about particular heads of loss, which were provisional. Um, that's para, that's para 10. Um, the, we then turn to, we can then, I think, jump over a number of the paragraphs. To para 19, to para 19. We, he then disposes of two heads of loss, so to speak, or heads of claim at 19 and 20, which I don't need to look into now. Um, and then para 21, against that background, I turn to consider the principal claims for damages. And we now have Mr. Dagnall's submissions being recited again. In, this is submissions made at the quantum stage rather than the liability stage. Previously, he's been, he's been reciting submissions previously made by Mr. Dagnall in August of the year before. Submitted in the case of fraud and breach of contract, an entity can decide to rely on either its fraud claims or its contract claims. That's a question of election, of course. We'll come back to that on my landed, on my landed friend's cross appeal. Two, the fraud, including the tort measure, is that there must have been a mistake. There must be a, 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 an error in the, in the um, recording there. But I don't think it matters. I think it's clear enough. The price paid less the true value plus consequential losses. So that's the submission Mr. Dagnall is correctly making, I respectfully suggest. That's the proper measure. Price paid less true value plus consequential losses. Contract measure, then we don't need to worry about the contract measure. As Mr. Dagnall pointed out, the fraud measure is one which assists a claimant who's made a bad bargain, even if that was his own fault. Again, I respectfully say that was right. Three, a failure to mitigate, as has been found to be in the case, and does not prevent any damage to recovery, rather it requires, well, I think the Lord should read on. There's nothing um, um, difficult about that sentence. And then this sentence, which we, we quarrel with, with respect. In my judgment, a failure to mitigate affects the calculation of diminution of value. It doesn't. Uh, same being my Lord's example of Mr. Smith coming along and saying, I'll buy you out the day after. Saving that type of extreme case, which this is not, that is just wrong with the greatest respect. A failure to mitigate does not affect the calculation of diminution of value. Um, 
It does not give rise to any additional head of damage. Again, that's wrong. It doesn't really matter. Of course, if you incur reasonably cost to try and get yourself out of a hole and it doesn't get you out of a hole but you've properly done it, then you can claim and your lordship doesn't need to be schooled on that principle, of course. So that's power of 21. Power of 22 now. Another, we have further submissions from Mr. Daniel. Also the case, the aim is to ensure that the victim of fraud is fully compensated for having entered the transaction. Correct. And from which the following follows. The fact that the relevant loss or lack of value is unconnected with the fraudulent misrepresentation is irrelevant as it is recoverable so long as it's connected with the transaction. Correct. In my respectful submission. Quite correct as a submission. Three, the fact that the relevant loss or lack of value arises from something hidden which no one and not even the most careful purchasers would or could have known about is irrelevant. Again, correct. And one only has to go back to the remarkable facts of Smith New Court to see that example in action. The question is simply what is the actual value? I, its value, if everything had been known of what was acquired and its difference to the purchase price paid. Correct. Absolutely orthodox law being submitted by my learned friend Mr. Daniel as he then was. Four, the fact that the victim is irrespective of fraud grossly overpaid for the relevant asset owing to the victim's own carelessness or over-optimism in agreeing the price or entering into the transaction is irrelevant and no defense. There you have it, my lords. Mr. Daniel alights upon the precise point that I found, at least partially found, this appeal on. And I commend that submission to your lordships as correct. Judge Hodge disagreed with it. And there lies my respectful quarrel with Judge Hodge. The victim can still recover, says Mr. Daniel, the entire loss arising from their overpayment in the transaction. And there is no defense in the circumstances of breaking causation or of contributing negligence. Correct. I respectfully suggest. Para 23. Mr. Daniel submits that in terms of overpayment, the purchase price is crucial to identify relevant matters which Glossop did not or did think at the time of his agreement and thus factored into his agreement with the purchase price. Since if the purchase price was calculated by Glossop on the basis of there being a particular problem, then there could be no overpayment as a result of that problem having actually existed as it had actually been accurately taken into account. Now, what, what, sorry, let me just finish that sentence. However, if the purchase price was calculated on the basis that a particular problem did not exist or had not been considered or on some other over-optimistic basis, and it turns out the problem did exist or the basis was over-optimistic, then there's been a recoverable overpayment. Completely correct. I mean, one might say that is over-complicating matters and that you can just simply cut straight to the chase. But, but using it as a forensic tool to get to the right answer, it's not wrong. And let's just give that, let's just exemplify that submission in one of the facts of this case. One of the, one of the principal sums of money that was relied upon by Mr. Green and indeed agreed, as I'll show you by Ms. Anne Gibbonson, as going to reduce the purchase price and arriving at the proper value was a figure your lordships would have seen or may have seen of £120,000 of unanticipated storage costs. And essentially, the point is as follows, and I'll, I'm preempting a submission I will make, but I'm trying to explain and give flesh to the submission there made by Mr. Dagger. The evidence was that Glossop, in agreeing to pay the £1.253 million for the overall assets purchased under contract number one, the APA, and in particular agreeing to pay the £300,000 of that ascribed to goodwill, or notionally ascribed to goodwill, had proceeded on the basis that once the purchase had taken place, they could offload the old mill, and then everything could take place on the one site. This is my storage cost point. And that had factored in, they factored that optimistic, or that, as it turned out, over-optimistic assumption into the price they were willing to pay, and that's perfectly commercially understandable. As it turns out, that was over-optimism, and that they, the company would always have had to incur 
storage costs, so external storage costs, which were calculated, and I, can I just emphasize this and re-emphasize this? This is agreed by Ms. Ibbotson, the, the defendant's expert, that the external storage costs that they, acting re proper, reasonably or not over-optimistically, should have taken into account when deciding on what purchase price to enter into, were £120,000. It's an agreed figure. So what Mr. Dagger is there saying is that the purchase price was calculated on the basis that a particular problem did not exist, i.e. there was not going to be the need for incurring external storage costs post-completion of the sale. And as a result, they were willing to pay more for the asset. But it turns out the problem did exist. Indeed, it did, and everyone agreed that. There was always going to be a need for external storage costs, even in the events, even if everything had turned out fine, and irrespective of the, the, the frauds perpetrated on my clients. Um, and that led to an overpayment. So, my lords. I, I just don't, I don't, I'm afraid I'm, I'm still bemused. I mean, this, why did Mr. Dagnall submit that in terms of overpayment of the purchase price, you had to identify relevant matters about what Glossop may or may not have thought. That the, the, the overpayment of the purchase price claim is, as we have agreed, simple. It's the difference between the price and what, what, what the assets bought were actually worth. What Glossop may or may not have thought may be relevant to consequential loss, maybe. But it's definitely not relevant to that calculation. So this is a submission that is confused at the best, isn't it? Well, I, I can well see, my lord, that, that, that one way of going about the, the answering the question, what was the actual value of the asset acquired? You, you could have taken a different way. And indeed, Mr. Dagnall and my, my expert below did indeed take a different way. And I'm going to show you a watch of that. They yeah. were, but Mr. Dagnall was discharging it in the way that Mr. We all, Mr. Dagnall has a very good reputation for, and a very sound and deserved reputation for thoroughness. He, he was, uh, uh, his experts, or his experts, and indeed Ms. Ibbotson, had both agreed that a proper and, or, or rather, a one forensic method to get to the right answer was, was this method. Both Ms. Ibbotson and Mr. Green had agreed this. I don't, had, and I don't understand how it can be. I mean, I just do not understand how you can uh, ascertain a market value by thinking about what people wrongly thought. Well, my lord, I, I'm going to show, look, I'm going to show your, well, I'm going to do two things. Thing one, I'm going to show you, Lord, just how the experts went about it. Mm. But thing two, I'm going to show you, Lord, this was not all the eggs in one basket. And, and, and that Mr. Dagnall made a, a, an entirely freestanding uh, 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 alternative submission. I mean, all this is only relevant to the question of whether Mr. Berrigan is right as, as to what he says in defence of your appeal. Well, as, as I understand it, Mr. Berrigan says the, 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 the measure of damage is obvious. Um, the, the, it was all confused by you, and you got what you asked for, and you can't now go back on it. That leads, you, me to three. That, that leads me to submission three, which is that, as I understand it, I wasn't there, but what Mr. Berrigan did not do below is say, this is all a load of old nonsense. Let's just get to the heart of the matter and say, and find out what the value of these assets is. His own expert... He was the defendant. He, if the claimant is saying, calculate my damages on basis X, and that's very beneficial to the defendant, he's hardly likely to say... No, 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 no. no. That's, not, that's not quite right, my lord, because Mr. Berrigan, as is clear from the judgment, didn't just say, this is a load of old nonsense, I'm not participating in this, do your worst, claimant, go down this mad rabbit hole, claimant, but I'm, I'm, I'm um, stepping back. He had, everyone proceeded on the basis of, let's look at the, let's go down this route, and let's treat it as a route which is of value. And we'll, and we'll see that the, the judge himself, when he came to look at the various heads that were identified by the experts, made mistakes even on the, even, you know, which is, which are, he didn't, the judge didn't say, 
what you're submitting, Mr. Dagnall, is, is deranged or whatever, and I'm just simply going to not participate in it. He, he participated in it and made findings which were on their own, in their own right, demonstrably erroneous, as I'm going to again show you logic. But the, I've got those points, and I'm going to ask them. Okay, okay. The key to this, Mr. Mr. Grant, as I'm trying to get, get you to for some time, is in the last uh, two sentences of 24, because there the judge encapsulates the question that's been worrying him since the liability judgment, uh, which is whether is a, a claimant is entitled to be overcompensated for his own commercial misjudgments or overoptimism. And the answer he got to that question, Mr. Dagnall having made a lot of submissions that were right and a lot of submissions that were wrong, is, um, I would say, with the, being as charitable as I know how, unintelligible. Now, what do you say about that? Because it does seem that the judge tried then to give effect to that. I don't, I don't accept for a moment that the judge simply said, I'm, when, when I'm arriving at my decisions on this case, I'm simply doing Mr. Dagnall's bidding and I'm agreeing with his submission and I'm going, and I'm going along with it. Um, this is, the, your, your lordship is looking at the last two sentences of Power 24. Sorry, the last three sentences. It's really the middle sentence. Mr. Dagnall's response was that the question was whether a particular loss or profit had been predicted or anticipated by Glossop. I mean, you know, with, again, you know, I haven't made up my mind about anything, but it seems to be totally wrong. Well, I think the point that Mr. Dagnall is, is um, aiming at there is that if you as a hypothetical, per if you as the purchaser, and you're the only purchaser on the scene, there's nobody else apart from Glossop, sees, sees, a, sees a, a, an asset, whatever it may be, and with full knowledge of an attribute of that asset, ascribes a value of X to it. Then, then that is of, of that's a piece of market information. With, because after all, Glossop is, a, is an actor within the market. And if Glossop has a, an informed actor in the market who's a commercial player, <clears throat> takes the view that with known attribute X, the value of the asset is 100 let's say, then that's a piece of useful piece of information to work out what the value of the asset with known attribute X is, because that's the market speaking. I, I, I mean, I understand that. And if that's what they said, I would, it would have been a very different thing, but they didn't I, say any of that at all. And what is more, they might easily have said that they knew it was a loss making business. They paid this value knowing it was a loss-making business, and they were, their fraudulent representations were fairly insignificant, and actually the business was worth what they paid for it, less the value of putting right um, what was fraudulently misrepresented. They might have said that too, but they didn't say any of that. <laughs> they, they said that it mattered as to what he he, the claimant, thought or didn't think, uh, or was optimistic or was not optimistic. And that is um, a confusion which unfortunately seems to have fed in to every corner of this case. Well, let, let me understand. I mean, your explanation actually is quite plausible that they well, thought what they were doing was looking at market value from the point of view of the negotiation and offer that the claimant had made. But if they had meant that, they should have said it. Well, can I look? Your, your lordship is, is alighting on a, a three short sentence of Power 24. Your lordship asked asked for an exegesis of what Mr. Dagnall meant by that response. I've given you what I believe to be a, a correct, and I, I can't look into the mind of Mr. Dagnall. It'd be yeah. wrong for me to, to yeah. recite what Mr. Dagnall may or may not have told me about it. But but on the face of it, what what Mr. Dagnall is saying, which I commend as having, and it, it's. There's a lot of authority, whether legal or otherwise, which which supports it. Um, which is that essentially, when you are trying to work out after the event the value of an asset, then then generally what actors in the market at the time think or don't think, and what value.
value they ascribe to things, knowing what those things are and having full knowledge, then that's a piece of market information. But what the crucial point that Mr. Dagle is saying is that if, if, as I see it, is that if purchaser X, knowing that asset Y has a particular feature, is willing to pay a then, then it is likely that, not inevitable, but likely that the asset, that the, the asset Y indeed had a value of 100 based on it having a particular attribute. What Mr. Dagle is saying is that in fact, the Glossop misunderstood the attributes of, of, of the asset in all sorts of ways. And I mean, one of them is the, the, the need for it, the need for the business to require external storage or not. That's something it didn't know and it didn't anticipate. So, so, and I'm going to show you, Lordship, that on any view, the judge on this hypothesis and, and, and forensic approach, which both experts agree, agreed with, <coughs> although it wasn't the only approach, as I'm going to show you, Lordship, that on any view, £120,000 should have been should have should have been awarded by way of damages to me, <coughs> to my to my clients, because that was an unanticipated loss. Or, or an unanticipated problem with the business. Nothing to do with the defendants, I'm not suggesting it was, but on the law as it stands, that should have fed into the direct loss. Well, well, I mean, just think, I mean, the only comment I'd make about that, Mr. Grant, is I don't understand. 120,000 was for storing stuff um, of, from the joint business. So it was something to do with uh, their own business, not to do with the business they bought. Well, but, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain that to you. But let, well, I'm, I'm pleased you will. Let's take a break now. We were going to take a break. And then, let's resume at, at midday. Thank you, Mark. Thanks.
My Lords, um, to resume, I, I think I said all I need to say about paragraph 24. Can I now turn to what I perceive to be the, the, the core paragraphs of this judgment, which are paragraphs 25 through to 29? Um, and 25, we see Mr. Berrigan's submission is recited um, that unknown or anticipated, unanticipated defects in the assets should be distinguished from mere features inherent in the assets, and they should also be distinguished from features or even defects in other assets. So, well, your lordships can read on. Now, I, I, I will confess, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Berrigan will assist your lordships when he comes to make his submissions as to what that submission meant. I speak for myself. It may be a deficiency of understanding on my part. Don't understand it. Um, Mr. Berrigan emphasizes the damage must flow directly from the transaction. Dagnall submitted that there was no difference between features and defects, and insofar as they have any meaning, features or defects, then I respectfully agree with Mr. Dagnall and commend that submission to your lordships. The question is, and here is Mr. Dagnall asking the right question, and not only that, inviting the court to answer the right question. What is the true value of the asset? A feature of an asset contributes to its true value whether it's a defect or not. Correct, in my respectful submission. The compensation measure is based on the true value of the contact business and is not limited to defects. Correct. Just simply, that is, if I may say so, asking precisely the question. Ah, I think we may have lost the master of the roles. No, you haven't. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, the compensation measure is based on the true value of the contact business is not limited to defects. And I... That's absolutely correct in my respect to submission. Dagnall submits that these features and their consequences were built into the price of £300, which was paid for contacts in tangible assets. The point he's making there is that, is that one has to assume it. Going about this forensic process, which I've identified, and of which the, the, both experts uh, 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 were, were adopted or partially adopted as one way of getting to the right answer. And I'm going to show you what, how they did how, how they did that is that 300,000 is a is a maybe a, a a secure foothold to work out the true of the true value by assuming that 300,000 is what was ascribed to the asset without recognizing or understanding any of the defects or features inherent within it then that may be a useful mechanism to then discount that to get to the right answer that's all that's being said and that's all the experts did um, those features, says such, Mr. Dangle says, as the need or lack of need for external storage charges arise from the combining of the two businesses, which combination was the only reason why anyone would have purchased to pay a positive, prepared to pay a positive price for the loss-making bit, contact business. I, the only reason that a value of £300,000 was ascribed to the goodwill was because of certain assumptions about savings that could be made, which proved to be, for whatever reason, unfounded. The price was calculated on that basis 
and that thus needs to incorporate that feature. That's what it was. And then this, if the combination of the two businesses was, was to be ignored, and your lordship may say, well, that's in fact, we're getting to the heart of the matter now, because it's just the asset acquired that is to be valued. Then the actual value of the contract business was nil. It's only a purchaser with a desire to combine the two businesses would have paid anything for the contact business, which I may put in parentheses, a massively loss-making business. And that, if I may say so, it may be your lordship will say, well, what did Mr. Dagwell need to say anything more? All he needs to say was that, to get to, to, get to his nil valuation for the assets for the goodwill acquired. But he did say it. He, he, he with characteristic and commendable thoroughness, he went about it in two different ways. But there, there's the submission, my lord. If you ignore the combination of the two businesses, and it may be said that, in fact, one way of looking at it is to simply say, look, you just look at the asset acquired. You forget about what synergies there might be. You forget about the special purchaser quality of the transaction. You're just looking at the asset. Then it is uh, um, that the, the actual value must be nil for understandable reasons. My lord, we then go over to, we're now coming to the judge's response to these submissions. Over the page, para 26. Mr. Dagnall refers to standard chartered bank, uh, which we all know, of course, and, and um, my lord has already made reference to it. No common law or statute defense of contributing negligence in case of fraudulent misrepresentation. Of course, that's, that's first year undergraduate law, of course. That is clearly the case when one is considering, and then this oddity, that is clearly the case when one is considering issues of liability. But when one cons turns to consider the question of the loss flowing from the entry into the transaction, in my judgment, the issue is not one of contributing negligence, but rather the question that damages flow directly from the transaction. I don't know what that means. But what is, with that, what is undoubtedly the case, I would respectfully submit, is that the judge has got the law badly wrong at that stage with, res with respect. We all know, my lords, that it's, it, it's, since 1945, the law has been that contributory negligence on the part of a claimant does not bar an action. Those, all those old authorities looked at by Mr. Granville Williams in his famous book on the subject from the 19th century and the 18th century have all disappeared as a result of 1945, the 1945 Act. So I don't know what, the, what that, what's being said there. Plainly, the point of standard chartered bank is not to say that contributory negligence is not a bar to an action. This doesn't can't be prayed in aid by a, by a fraudulent defendant in reduction of damages. So the judge, with my respect in respect to submission, got it badly wrong about that section. Para 103, and we're back to para 103 now, of my earlier judgment. I said the defendant who induced the claimant to enter into a transaction as a result of a fraudulent misrepresentation is bound to make full reparation. I said that a claimant should not be entitled, then your lordship can read on. So para 103 is back playing in the judge's mind, wrongly so, wrongly so. And then what are the consequences of that? Well, this is where the error starts, as I use, to use the metaphor I've already deployed, starts to take wing. In my judgment, a claimant cannot be expected to recover for factors which it had appreciated, and as to which it had made a commercial judgment, if that judgment turns out to be wrong. That's just a rejection of Mr. Dagnall's submission, and it may be it's a right, maybe your lordship has taken the view he's right or not. That's, that's the, the burden of my appeal. In my judgment, the question I posed at the beginning of this extemporary judgment, is a fraudulent seller liable for losses sustained as a result of commercial misjudgments on the part of the innocent purchaser, which are wholly unrelated to the fraud, save for the fact they result from the entry into the relevant transaction, receives a negative answer. Now, that is obviously not the judge saying, and I entirely agree with Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Dagnall's submission to like effect. That is a, a, a holding in the face of submissions to the contrary. Even in a claim for fraudulent misrep, a claimant is not entitled to recover the losses which directly flow from the entry into the relevant transaction if they were the product of his own commercial misjudgment or, or over-optimism. Now, that is fundamental to this judgment, that, that, that holding, and it's wrong with the, greatest, with the greatest respect. And he then puts that into effect, that holding, with the example of the storage costs. Now, with the storage costs, one could spend, in one world, one could spend many hours discussing the storage costs. That's not a world I'm commending to your lordship. 
It's a simple point, but it reveals the error of the judge in actual cash terms. Because essentially, putting it into its simplest form, the claimant was willing to pay whatever it paid for this asset based on a misapprehension of the savings it could achieve via between the experts at £60,000 per, per annum. So far, so good. No, there's no, no, dispute about, no dispute about that. But how does that, how does the judge's primary holding that I've just quoted to your lordship, your lordships, how does that play out? Well, power 20A, he sets the problem at 27. He answers the problem at 28 and 29. In my judgment, this is not properly a loss which results from the entry into the transaction. And then this further error, which constitutes another ground of appeal, but let's look at it all now. Even if the misrepresentations have been true, this loss would still have been incurred. Just pause there, my lord, please. My learned friend says, oh, this is just a sort of throwaway remark. It's not. It's at the center of the judge saying, how does my holding play out? in a real-world scenario, which is one of the central aspects of the claimant's case about value. He says this, that £120,000 cannot be taken into account when determining the actual value of the asset in respect to which recovery by way of damages, by way of direct loss can be made, because that £120,000 which they overpaid was down to their own folly or their own commercial misjudgment. And what is more, says the judge, compounding the problem yet further, even if the misreps had been true, this loss would still have been incurred. Simply wrong, in my respectful submission. It is absolutely no part of the law of damages for fraud that a, that a fraudulent defendant can say, by way of mitigation of loss, I'm saying mitigation in a different sense, by way of diminution of loss. Oh well, that loss would still have been incurred if my representations had been had been true. Just take the example of Smith New Court. If that if 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 my Lord, Lord Judge Hodge had been dealing with facts similar to Smith New Court, then he wouldn't have accorded Smith New Court the losses sustained as a result of the inherent Gehring fraud, your lordships may recall the facts of, of Smith New Court, because he, Judge Hodd would have said, well, even if the misrepresentations have been true, you would have still suffered, you the purchaser of the shares in Ferranti, would still have suffered the loss relating, which, which arose from the, un, the unrelated, hidden, Gehring fraud. But, my lord, that involves simply brick by brick, dismantling the law as it has stood since at least Smith New Court. And that simply can't be done, both for precedental reasons and intellectual reasons. Any financial, picking up again, any financial consequence flowing from this erroneous commercial assessment cannot, in my judgment, properly be laid at the door of even a fraudulent defendant. There, again, we are at the very dark heart of this judgment, the heart of this judgment. And it's just wrong with the greatest respect. And Mr. Berrigan, it's quite clear Mr. Berrigan was adopting that position in, contrary, in contrast to the position being adopted by Mr. Daffel. It may, he may have been right, it's a matter of your lordships. So, so what do you say, um, Mr. Grant? Do you say the £120,000 storage loss is oh. to be regarded as part of the direct loss as a reduction in the value of the business because of the way this claimant made its calculations absolutely not as a consequence not as a consequential loss i think the points were put in two different ways below but my primary submission is that it's an over it's an overpayment loss to use the vocabulary of the court 
of the yeah, I understand. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And the four below. And, and one of the further errors the judge made, which I can now show you. I'm sorry, just to, just to try and get my thinking straight. How do you, you, you say that you can just take one um, bit of miscalculation made by the claimants and say that translates directly into the value of what they bought um, without looking at absolutely everything else they took into account or didn't take into account and what the business was and how much it was making or not making and well, what the losses were. I mean, you're, you're sort of starting at the end of the calculation, as I understand it. What I'm doing, and I'm, I'm, this is just an example, I'm going to show your lordship how the experts treated this. But I'm, what I'm, and I don't want to take myself, I don't, I don't want to go to the experts now because I want to spend a little time on the experts, which will answer your lordship's question. But, but let me just say this immediately. Miss Ibbotson herself, the expert called by the defendant, put in the witness box by the defendant, not resiled from by the defendant, in turn said that she agreed that a proper approach to reaching the, the correct value was to start at 300 and then discount it pound for pound for the various unanticipated losses or costs incurred by the business as a result of commercial misjudgments it may, it may be. And she herself, in her own report, which I'm going to come to, and to make this point good, says that the storage costs should be reduced, should reduce the value by £120,000. So the, the, the experts were in agreement. And the reason the judge made the error, well, there's a further reason the judge made the error he made, which feeds into a further head of, 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 of ground of appeal. And that takes us to paragraph 29, which is the last paragraph I'm going to look at for a while in this judgment. Um, and I invite your lordships now to turn to 29, which is page, I think, 174 of the electronic bundle. This is, he's, 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 the judge has quoted from Lord Stay from, the, from Smith New Court. I don't immediately understand how any of the dicta of Lord Stay uh, um, assists the judge at that moment, but that's maybe a matter for Mr. Berrigan to explain, because he, he promoted those, those dicta. And then, here, and then this, this short paragraph 29. Here, in my judgment, there is no sufficient causal link between the fraudulent misrepresentations that there was no outstanding issue between the electric, electricity supply serving or the flooding affecting Unit 3 and the need for external storage. Now, if Judge Hodge had been sitting at first instance in Smith New Court, he would have denied Smith New Court the losses flowing from the Garrett fraud. But the law is now fixed, and Judge Hodge, whatever he may think the law should be, is not entitled to depart from Smith New Court. That then we carry on. Any loss suffered in that regard is not, in my judgment, the direct consequence of the entry into the relevant transaction. Blossom appreciate there was an issue about storage, and they believe they could turn it to their advantage. They believe that good management could eliminate the need for external storage costs. I, they proceeded on the basis that these costs would not be, have to be incurred, because it was all going to be on one site. It was all going to be fine. The fact they got that wrong, again, here is the error in action, is, in my judgment, due to fact it's not a direct result of transaction. Presumably, the judge would have said it's a direct result of their misapprehension or their over-optimism. It is not something that sounds in damages, even in a claim for fraudulent misrepresentation. Now, look, there are, I would respectfully suggest, a number of errors lurking or, or, or well, explicit in that paragraph. The first is that he is um, simply mis 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 um, applying Smith New Court in a very fundamental way. Secondly, he is applying the false law or the incorrect law he's propounded at paragraph 27. And thirdly, and in any event, he is treating the £120,000 storage costs as if, as if it were a head of damage in respect of which we were seeking a sum of £120,000 by way of damages. He's completely misunderstanding what, what this £120,000 was doing by agreement between the experts, which is not, we were not primarily seeking this as a head of consequential loss so that there should be paragraph X of the order 
there should be judgment for £120,000 in favour of C1. What we were doing, and what the experts agreed was being done, is utilising that as a method and a tool to arrive at the true value of the asset acquired. So talking about sufficient causal link, it's just nothing to the point. In any event, it's wrong even on its own terms. My Lord, there are multiple problems with paragraph 29, which reveal the extent, in my respectful submission, of the judge's error. Now, I want to move on. That There are some further paragraphs in the quantum judgment which I wish to look at at a later stage in my submissions. But those are the relevant material paragraphs setting out the judge's approach. My Lords know what the outcome of the appeal, of the judgment was. And there's an order. The order is at tab 17, page 181 of the bundle. And it might be worth just having a very brief look at that order now. It's a short order. It's dated the 14th of April. That's the date it was sealed. In fact, it was made on the 9th, the same day as the judgment. And your Lordships can see page 182 of the electronic bundle. Then in judgment, the second claimant in the sum of $32,800. That's a contractual claim. My learned friend has a point on that in his cross appeal. That related to breaches of warranty in what was known as the LSA, the lease sale agreement. That's the final agreement for Unit 3. No further judgment or award on the claims by the claimants. Judgments for the first defendant in the sum of $72,000. You may think, what on earth? Where did that come from? Well, my Lord, that's arrived at by a bit of pragmatic set-off. So that there was £112,000 always accepted to be owed as the fourth and final deferred installment. I mentioned that to your Lordships earlier this morning. Against that £112,000 was certain judgments in favour of C1, which were consequential losses. And your Lordships may have seen there were two items of consequential loss that Glossop was awarded. That's £6,000 for a generator. You don't need to worry about that. Nobody's contesting that. And £19,600 in the costs of the expert determination in late 2017. Both referred to in the quantum judgment. In and of themselves, subject to a point my learned friend makes, not contentious. So that the £72,000 figure is simply the sums due to Glossop against the sums due to back from Glossop to contact. Minus one from the other, you get a net sum. No, there's no other magic to it than that. There's a bit of interest and there's a cost order. Is that explained in the schedule, Mr. Grant? Sorry, my Lord? Is that what's explained in the schedule? Exactly right. The schedule is, in fact, in the document, headed schedule. That's exactly right. Entitled the set-off, damage of £46,000. That £46,000 is inclusive of I think it's inclusive of a certain amount of interest and some further interest on top of that. But £46,000 is essentially the claim, are the damages awarded to the first claimant for consequential losses alone. The outcome was that the claimant, the first claimant, received no damages at all under the direct loss head, which is a notable fact, it may be thought. Now, my Lord, I want to now turn to the pleadings, which are going to take five minutes alone. It's never a happy submission to say that in terms of the pleadings before the Court of Appeal. I'm going to be as, as they are, they are, they start at page 194, tab 20 of the core bundle. I think it's fair to say that they are lengthy. The only paragraph I wish to show your Lordship was paragraph 52, page 219 of the bundle, electronic page that is, where we have the financial claims. By reason of the matters of force, they have the claims of suffered loss and damage. Now, the 
the, the relevant paragraph is little c over at 218. They've overpaid for the contact business and the unit three lease as against their true value. This is little c at the top and suffered in other expenditures. The difference in situation and or value is estimated to be the to sum total of the various financial amounts set out below, both generally because the claims if they had proceeded with the acquisitions would have reduced their bids to reflect those matters. However, the claim is also claiming the alternative in relation to the overpayments on a pure difference in value basis, and which is a matter for expert evidence. And that, of course, is an entirely conventional plea. That's 52C. What does the defendant say? Well, the defendant say, page 262 um, of the electronic bundle. Um, well, let's go to parent. If, if, let's start, please, at page 261, where we can see that para 75 is responding to para 52 of the claims paragraph numbering under damages and financial claims. And all that I need to show your lordship is, I think, Roman 2 of 75B, page 262, top of the page. In the case of claims by Glossop, which is what we're dealing with here, in relation to the subject matter of the APA, the difference in value between what was paid to the assets and what they were worth. That is the admission as to the true measure of loss, insofar as liability was established, which, of course, at the time it was contentious. Um, and that will come as no surprise to your lordships. What, what did Mr. Daggle say by way of reply? Well, the reply is, is um, a, le a lengthy document. But fortunately, I, can, I need to show your lordships, I think, four lines of it. Page 308 um, of, the, of the electronic bundle, tab 22. Your lordships will see a page headed damages and financial claims, para 73. Little to under B. In principle, damage of misrep is the difference between the actual outcome and what would have been the outcome had the induced transactions not occurred, and thus extends the difference between what was paid and the value of what was obtained. Again, entirely correct in my respectful submission. So on the pleadings, the, the position was on the face of it subject to questions of liability and subject to what the experts might say. At least the proper measure was uncontentious. I now want to turn, if I may, to the supplemental bundle and take your lordships on a canter through the expert evidence, which I conceive I have to do because it is suggested by my learned friend that the expert, that the claimant's expert, somehow boxed the judge in in a way that meant that he was inevitably had to make the findings he made and the holdings he made. I dispute that. Um, and certainly the holdings that he made were not in any way holdings that were induced by Mr. Dagnall or Mr. Green. They were holdings the judge arrived at in the teeth of submissions by Mr. Dagnall, which I'd say were wrong. But more broadly, I want to show your lordship how the matter was put. Um, I'm going to go as quickly as I can, conscious that your lordships are not particularly interested in looking at old expert reports. Now, your lordship have, an, have a supplemental bundle, which contains the voluminous expert evidence put in this, in this case. Um, the, the first report of Mr. Green, who was the expert accountant for the claimants, was produced in April 9th, 2019, i.e. Before, um, before, the, before the court sat in August, at a time when the court understood and all the parties understood that it was going to be a single trial of everything. We know that that didn't transpire. Um, First, I'm going, to, I'm going to take this at a canter, and your lordship will stop me or hurry me up, as the case may be. Para 12, page 12, please. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Page 10, I, page 10, actual paginated page 10 is what electronic page? I'm asking your lordship, not ask your lordship, of course, I'm asking my learned junior. 12. I believe page 12 electronic should start with a, with a paragraph 310. This is Mr. Green's first report. Starts with... Uh... Uh, it's the previous page. Right. What's that? What's, can I, I'm sorry to invite you. What, what, what's the... Ele electronic 11. Ele paper page 10. Has yeah. to be. Thank you very much, my lord. I'm sorry to, sorry to seek your assistance on that. I just shouldn't have needed to do that. Um, yeah, page 11, electronic page 11, we see 310. And what, what, what Mr. Green does is he shows the... Res he sets out the results 
of contact. That is the business that was actually being acquired um, over, the last few, over the last few years. These demonstrate that although the turnover of the business brought is similar, contact was sustaining significant losses and had done so for a number of years. And indeed, it, it's possibly just worth, although the judge made a finding on this, it's worth considering the full extent of those losses. If your logic just briefly turns to page 29, electronic, this is indeed shaped appendix four that the, um, Mr. Green was referring to. If your logic just turns to that, your logic will see the, the, the business that was being acquired, i.e. contact limited, the assets thereof rather than the shares thereof, your logic will see catastrophic um, losses being sustained year on year over the preceding four years or so. I don't, need to, I don't think I need to take, take your logic to the precise numbers, but your logic just, by casting the most cursory of eyes, can see, can see the extent of the losses. Turning back then to page 11, that's 310. We then, we can then, I've shown you Orchard 310. Um, Three eleven and three twelve show again. Your logic can take this pretty quickly. Can show how the the the, the directors of Glossop were understood. They could save all. Made, they could make all sorts of savings and profits by combining the businesses into one site. That's three twelve. Um, and it turned out that was all based on mis commercial misjudgment or over optimism. Over the page to page 12, my lord, we'll see a new sub item 4. And in fact, I think I may have got, I may have misled your lordships a little earlier. 401 sets out the, the, the three contracts, you don't need to look at that. 402 says that the asset purchase it did provide for the purchase price was the aggregate of those three numbers. And then that's two, and that. 173 and 30 is the 203 I showed you logic for stock and work in progress. The logics can go over the page, please, to page 13. Para 407, hence in total, I consider the 300 pounds, 300,000 pounds being paid for goodwill, and then he explains why. 407. 409. The value of the goodwill in a business is typically measured by reference to the profitability of the business by applying a multiplier to the annual profits. Not a not a entirely revolutionary proposition, the lawyers may think. 410. In this case, contact has been in suffering losses for a number of years, and thus, as a standalone business, there would normally be little or no value attributed to the goodwill. Now, your lawyer might think, well, why don't you just stop there? Here's an asset, bought for £300,000, loss-making business, worth nil, ergo damages by way of loss of £300,000. He went on to say at 411, page 14, nevertheless there are significant benefits derived by gloss of cartons from the acquisition. These include the opportunity to combine both business onto one site at Hague Avenue, that's the, the contact site, units three to five, together with the additional turnover provided by the customers of contact. It was anticipated that combining the two businesses would generate additional profits as the overheads would be reduced by operating from one site. Um, that's, four, that's 411. There is a... Seven one, and then I wanted to show your lordships as part of my counter. Um, 717 which is page 24 of the electronic bundle. The goodwill of contact was effectively valued at 300,000 on acquisition. The value of the of goodwill of the business typically met. And then we have 718 and a replication of the paragraphs I've already showed your lordship, as is 720. 721, the value of goodwill as at the 23rd of November was effectively the value of at which the consideration was agreed over and above the value of the tangible assets. It represented the opportunity for Glossop to combine the business benefit with improved benefit premises of Hague, Hague and economies and synergies of scale. That's 721. 722, the value at that time was a subjective 
matter. Taking this into account, the good of £300,000 being twice the anticipated increase in pre-tax profits does not seem unreasonable. I, based on the assumptions and misconceptions that were running through the claimant's mind, it was not unreasonable to pay £300,000. But based on the fact they were making certain uh, uh, predictions and assumptions, which proved not to be correct. That's, seven, that's paragraph... 723. Now, I don't think we need to go any further into that report because it is only the first of many, and I can assure your lordships I'm not going to be taking your lordships to it to, to every single one of them. I just want to do this a, a broad canter. There's then a further report by Lords Tab 2, page 40, produced by Mr. Green in May, just a few a few weeks after his first report. And this is before Ms. Ibbotson had, had spoken, because there was consequential exchange had been ordered. So we're now in the second report of Mr. Green, dated May 2019. And I want to briefly show you, Lordship's para 402 onwards. That's page 52. And at para 401, we're back to an explanation of the, the breakdown of the of the 1.253 million consideration. I didn't say anything more about that. 402, section seven, I concluded the amounts paid for the individual class of asset were reasonable having regard to the circumstances of loss at the time and the opportunity afforded by combining the businesses and subsequent sale processes derived from the sale of significant proportion of machinery acquired. The valuation applies to scenario 1C, being the business able to, so with that, we're getting into complexity there, which your lawyers don't need to trouble yourself with. Essentially, there were various scenarios about what might have happened or what assumptions were correct or false, which your lawyers don't need to be troubled. Um, the, and then 404, in respect to scenario 1A, that's a, based on a particular assumption. Unit 3 could be used for storage only until a particular date. And then 405, it, if it had been known at 23rd of November, that's completion date, that the business would be required to maintain two sites, as in fact proved to be the case, then there would have been significant uncertainty of whether profits could be improved upon as the unanticipated costs would be substantially restricted, savingly substantially restricted. So what all in all ships need to take away from that is that essentially the 300,000 figure was based on certain assumptions which proved to be false. And indeed, it, it couldn't be. The business as combined could not be run as it turned out. Whatever, whatever the defendants had misrepresented or not misrepresented um, uh, from a single site, and therefore the claimants had, had made false uh, assumptions, which had fed into a calculation of consideration which was bad. That's all I wanted to show your lordships in that particular um, paragraph. The, or and then 406, on that basis alone, he would reduce the value of the goodwill to, to 100,000 on that assumption. Miss Ibbotson gave her first report in May 2019. My lords, that's at tab three of the supplemental bundle, starting at page 59 of the electronic pagination. And all I need, I think, to show your lordship here is paragraph 7.1, um, which is page 72 of the electronic bundle. Because Miss Ibbotson, here, page 72, electronic bundle, paragraph 7.1, she has now, she's read Mr. Green's reports because they came earlier, sequential exchange, as I say. Para 7.1, I note that in his report, Mr. Green has assessed the value of contact using the net assets method, as opposed to the profits or a, a multiplier uh, method, because of course there are no profits to multiply. I consider this approach to be reasonable, says Ms. Ibbotson. 7.2, within his report, Mr. Green has separated the value of contact into its plant and machinery, stock and work in progress, and goodwill. As I've shown your lordship, and I consider this approach to be reasonable. As also set out in Green's report, it's not anticipated the value of contact plant and machinery or stock and work and progress were affected by the alleged misrepresentations. In fact, what he said was that they are, nobody suggested they were worth were precisely what they were paid for, was paid for them. But in any event, such that the only matter of contention relates to goodwill. 7.3, within his report, Green has assessed the value of goodwill included in the value in the purchase 
but a state of 300, but the state this would be reduced to 200 or 200,000, depending on the various scenarios taken. All that needs to be taken away from this is that Ms. Ibbotson accepts and considers it reasonable, this is 7.3 last sentence, that the value of goodwill under particular scenarios should be reduced by the anticipated cost of rectifying the problems to Unit 3. So the defendant's expert is agreeing that one forensic method of arriving at the true value is to take the price paid as somehow the price, the value of the asset based on a number of false assumptions, and then discount that once one factors in the cost of those assumptions once they've been exploded, so to speak. That's all I wanted to say at 7.3 in respect to Ms. Ibbotson. There's then a number of questions are posed and answered. I didn't show you much of those. What then happens is, my lords, as your lordships will recall, the judge says produce a new set of reports in August 19 or September 19 after he's delivered his liability judgment. And the first of those reports, again sequential, and Mr. Green produces a new report and that's tab 9 and it is page 116 of the bundle. And this is a very lengthy report and I'm not going to trouble your lordship with the bulk of it. Your lordship, the bulk of it. But we've extracted certain irrelevant parts to just reduce the amount of paperwork placed upon your lordships. So it starts with the introduction at page 116. There's then a variety of introductory comments. Page 120, please. Para 202. I understand that following the first judgment, the claim is made up of two elements. Little 1, Roman 1, the difference in the price paid and the actual value. So he's not getting it wrong as to what the true measure of loss is. 2, the consequential losses. Again, that's correct. I think we can jump straight to Para 220 now, please. And what Mr. Green says at 220 is this. I assume that the value of goodwill reduces pound for pound in respect to the additional costs and consequential losses arising. So what he's basically saying there, and I may be repeating myself, is I start as a forensic tool to get to the right answer. I start with £300,000 as being the value of the asset based on all the assumptions that were made by the claimants. Once you've exploded those assumptions, because they're wrong, because they were wrong, and costed them out, you can then do a pound for pound reduction. And he then reduces the goodwill figure of £300,000 in two different ways. Way 1 is consequential losses of £260,000, and way 2 is contract claims unanticipated costs of £322,000. That adds up to £593,000. And of course, on that basis, the revised goodwill has got a negative value and therefore is given a zero value in the little table at 220. He then says at 221, I'm going to come back to 211 and 214, but at 221 he says, in either scenario, the consequential losses and unanticipated costs arising exceed the value attributed to goodwill. Hence, I consider the value of goodwill actually acquired should be reduced to zero. And just to complete my counter, 211 and 214 are referred to in the table at 220. 211 is page 122. And these are cashed out as a variety of consequential losses flowing from entering into the transaction. And one can see the £260,000 figure there. And then 214 over the page, page 123 of the electronic, one can see the £332,000 figure, which we've already looked at, page 220. And two of those are made up of figures which have already been the subject of an award. The Bramall claim, you don't need to worry about that, that's entirely agreed by everyone. 
and then the, the independent barrister claim of 19,000. That's 440,000. But then these two figures, the additional costs of works required to unit three of 172,000 pounds, I'm going to explain that in a little while. Don't worry about that, please, now, my lords. But then the, the, an old friend of ours, the additional storage costs of 122,000 pounds. So this makes this what essentially the, Mr. Mr. Green is saying that these are costs which were not anticipated. They didn't think they'd have to pay them, and as a result, they were willing to pay three hundred thousand pounds for the goodwill. As it turns out, they did have to pay them because they made a mistake. And I'm going to deduct pound for pound that hundred twenty thousand from the three hundred thousand pound figure. So when the judge, in his judgment, quantum judgment, treats this as a claim for, for actual damages. He's just getting it wrong. I mean, he's getting a number of things wrong, but he's getting that wrong in and of itself. That's a point I've already made, but there it is in action, if I may say so. So that's 214. Let me, we then, can we then turn to page 125? Um, we see the broad brush approach. I mean, I see that the judge may have got it wrong by doing this exercise, but surely this exercise is not a valid method of valuing the business that they... Well, my lord, my lord I, I can't hand on heart say that because Ms. Ibbotson herself, as I'm going to show your lordship, agreed with it. Um, I mean, she did agree with it, but I mean, it's, it's a subjective approach. I mean, it's just looking at the valuation through the eyes of what one buyer um, wanted, wanted from the business by way of synergies. Well, I, I, yes, I, I, you value, you don't really value open market assets by looking at what one buyer, I mean, unless it was something that generally all buyers in the market would be able to create synergies. I mean, it's a, it's a special case. It doesn't give you an open market value. It gives you the value to this customer. My Lord, I, I, I don't fully agree with respect, fully agree with your Lordships in the sense of took the view, this was a, and I, I know I've used this word before, and that phrase before, I'm going to use it again, it's a forensic tool to write, reach the right answer. But Mr. Green, as I'm going to show your lordship, was very careful in this report to also, to also approach value simply by reference to the goodwill of a loss-making company is nil. So it was there. And, and, and that's a submission that Mr. Dagnall himself made at Power 25. So there are two methodologies at work with a view to assisting the court as much as possible. And let me make that point good, if I may. I'm going to be delaying the motion. It's too much longer on this report, I hope. Page 125, electronic bundle. Broad brush approach. As discussed in section six, it's uncertain how the goodwill, goodwill of three others are derived. I assume the claims are anticipating improved profits from the combined business. Therefore, are prepared to pay a sum, a goodwill figure, over and above the value of tangible assets, blah, blah, blah. 225, significant element of this relates to being able to operate wholly from the site of Hague Value, Hague Avenue, resulting in substantial savings. You, your Lordship's heard about that. 226, the issues related to the electricity supply and flooding were significant in terms of site of the production facility and the need to continue using off site storage would also reduce the benefits of locating. 227, in addition, contact have been incurring losses for a number of years. 228, taking all these facts into account, had all the unknown fact issues been known prior to completion, it would, in my opinion, have been a reasonable course of action for the buyers to have withdrawn from the, tran the, tran the transaction. Um, and then over the page at 126, um, 229, alternatively, if the, if the buyers have proceeded, in my opinion, I consider that given the risks involved, had the unknown issues been known, this would result in the offer of the goodwill being reduced to an initial sum of, say, uh, of, say one pound. And then the broad brush approach, the value of the goodwill re required being 229, 299, um, That's 300,000 less the notional figure of a pound. And then your lordships can read, can read on. And then 231, however, in overall conclusion, I prefer the approach summarized at 223 with losses of 593,000. Now, and then this is because if the valuation of the assets required is to reflect the consequential losses and the unanticipated costs arising from the fraudulent misrepresentations. I think that must be the transaction induced by the fraud of Mr. Then, uh, as these were not factored into the price, then the actual value requires them to deduct from the price paid. Now, it's no part of my appeal that your lordship should say, well, very good, 
we're going to enter judgment with £593,000 in favour of the claimant. As you know, my primary, my primary position is your lordship should remit this claim so it to be, to be tried on a, proper ba- on a proper basis and with proper guidance from your lordships as to what the law should, should be. But even if your lordships were not persuaded of that 593 figure at 231, if your lordships will recall the 593 figure is the sum total of the two figures at para 220, consequential losses and anticipated costs, add them together, 593, or 496 on a different hy- hypothesis which your lordships don't need to worry about. Um, even if your lordships were not persuaded of that. He's also said, Mr. Green, the other way of looking at it is this is just a valueless company. And therefore, a notional value of a, of a pound, C229. And but my lord, it doesn't, it goes further than that. It goes further than that. Because we then go to paragraph 127, page 127, electronic. Um, paragraph 4, or section 4. And a lot of this is, is precisely what he had said earlier in the year, before Judge Hodge had produced his first judgment. And if we go over to, and a lot of it, I don't need to read it out because a lot of it's the same. Paragraph, page 128, paragraphs 407 to 410. I invite your lordship just to cast an eye over that, in particular 410. So Mr. Green is not just giving up that point. He is saying, as a standalone business, there would normally be little or no value attributed to the goodwill. And again, as I say, not a revolutionary proposition. It may be. That was evidence before the judge, which he, for whatever reason, simply chose to ignore. And not only was that, it was it was a submission made by Mr. Dagmore, encapsulated at the back end of Para 25, of the quantum judgment where Mr. Dagnall says, if you ignore the synergies, if you ignore the two businesses coming together, just look at it on its own, it's nil, because nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to buy the goodwill. Now, your lordship may say, well, Mr. Dagnall may have overcomplicated things, but, but, but that's, that's not the point. The point is, two analyses were put forward before the judge, one of which your lordship may think is the more conventional one, but the other which had the benefit of being adopted by both experts, and not solely adopted by Mr. Green, because he had, he had both, both analyses in play. Um, and the judge just, A, misunderstood the, 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 the pound for pound reduction analysis, but B, simply ignored the other analysis, and didn't do, and this is ground one of my appeal, didn't do what he had to do, which was actually value the asset. Um, so that's, that's 410. And then, and then let me go finally to, four, to, to paragraph 614, which is page 137, electronic. We're now in goodwill, paragraph, this is section 6, 137, the goodwill of contact is effectively valued at £300,000 on acquisition. This is agreed by myself and Miss Ibbotson. Um, aye, that was the value ascribed by the claimant, as your lordship knows. The value of the goodwill in the business is typically measured by reference to the profit of the business by applying the multiplier to the annual profit, 615. 616 over the page at 138. In this case, contact has been suffering significant losses for a number of years, and your lordship has seen this before. Nevertheless, it was anticipated by buyer and seller there were significant benefits. Your lordship has seen that before as well. Para 618 and Para 619. Your Lordship have seen that before as well. And then, I don't want to, I, I, I'm, I've been speaking too much in terms of hectoring your Lordships with, with quotation, but can I invite your Lordships just to read on from 620 to the bottom of 624, which provides, in my respectful submission, insights into the way that the expert, if we're talking about two different methodologies, one, the pound for pound methodology, two, the goodwill in a non-profitable business is, is nil. I'm taking the methodology one. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Green, a para 621 to 624, 
explains his methodology in respect to methodology one. Now, thank you for doing that. Now, the final piece of the jigsaw is Ms. Ibbotson's own report, which was produced in January 2020, page 168, electronic bundle, tab 10, as far as that is, of, of, of benefits your lordships. Um, and let's just, again, take this as quickly as possible. Page 172, para 210. She says she's read with interest the supplementary report of Mr. John Green. That is the report served in November, pursuant to the judge's September order for the purposes of the quantum trial. Over the page at 211. Uh, <clears throat> and I, can I just invite your lordships to read 211 and 212 rather than me rendering myself hoarse reading them? herself says it is a valid mechanism to work out the true value in her opinion and we can see that in action if we shoot straight to 5.37 which is page 192 of the electronic we get to a summary And there she says, based on the information, that, and then there's a what she's recited at Paris 5.4 to 5.36, Glossop's additional anticipated costs, recoverable due to deceit, recoverable due to deceit, says Ms. Ibbotson, speaking for the defendants, and I'm not aware that the defendants abjured this report in any shape or form, can be summarized as follows. And then there are a bunch of um, deductions. We can forget about £6,000, that's been accounted for elsewhere. We can forget about the 40,000 that's accounted for elsewhere. That's the that's the, um, the Bramall claim, so-called the independent barrister claim. The 18,000, the 55,000 claim, we can park. But let's just look at the down the bottom, the 120 and the 172. So that's a, so Ms. Ibbotson, subject to the judge a particular variable, which I'll come to immediately, that is a proper figure to deduct to reach the true value of the asset. The 172 figure, your lordship sees at the potential anticipated refurbishment, that will probably be a little bit opaque to your lordships at the moment, so I'm going to try and render it unopaque in the short time that I can. But let's just stick up with the 120 figure, which I've spent a long time over this morning. 5.26 is the guide which she helpfully gives us, Ms. Ibbotson. They turn to 5.26, page 188. And I think we can. We don't need to go through the long run up to the wicket without any disrespect to Ms. Ibbotson. But 5.26, 18. Therefore, the unanticipated costs of external storage incurred as a result of deceit, if it were to be accepted that the claimants had factored any such costs into the purchase price negotiated, can be summarised as follows, and that's nil. Now, pausing there. This is this is Ms. Ibbotson. We'll pause there, actually. Mr. Grant, um, it's, uh, it's, it's one o'clock. Um, we'll uh, resume at two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.